Three girls, eight, nine, and ten, were beaten to death early today while spending the first night of a week-long stay at a Girl Scout camp in northeastern Oklahoma. We've seen plenty of heinous murders, but something like that, three Girl Scouts at a camp. The closer I got, I could just see that this this young girl was was dead. And I started to scream. My God, what happened inside of that tent? The idea that somebody could come into this camp at night and not be discovered with all these girls and counselors around is pretty stunning. I thought it was women. Lori died at night. And everything did change from that moment to right now. Whoever wrote the note said that I'm going to kill three Girl Scouts. And the counselors thought it was just a prank. That's what convinces the largest manhunt in Oklahoma State history. Who exactly is it that we're up against here? It never, never occurred to me that after you got there, you might die. discovered beaten to death today and at least one of them was sexually molested what hit me in 1977 as a young reporter the hardest was these are kids and it's one of the things i never got over I tell you, I never had heard of Locust Grove, Oklahoma before. We had to break out the maps just to try to figure out where it was and what roads we could use to get to it. In Mays County back then, there were probably around 30,000 people. This is a place where the Cherokee Nation was resettled in the Trail of Tears. It is hilly, it is wooded, there's a lot of water, and it's a perfect place for scouting camps. Well, my first summer that I ever went to Camp Scott was in 1971. And after that, there was never any doubt in my mind that that's where I wanted to spend every summer. As a child growing up in small town Georgia, I was a Girl Scout too. I loved being a scout. And I still remember the promise, my heart. On my honor, I will try to do my duty to God, to and God my, country. my country. To help other people at all times. To obey the Girl Scout law. 1977 was the first year that I was actually hired to be a Girl Scout counselor. I can actually smell Camp Scott. I can smell the sycamore trees along the creek. It's summer and it's morning and, and the light is just kind of dappling through the trees. My fondest memory of Girl Scouting is just singing around a campfire. As friends we have grown together Walked the long trails together, gazed at the stars together. Together we have done many things, many things. That's a Girl Scout song. <laughs> When those girls got on that bus to go to camp, they didn't want to die. And they should not have died. And we've lived with that for 45 years. I'm Harold Berry. I'm retired from the Iowa 
Patrol. I was at home in bed asleep. My headquarters called me up, told me that Girl Scouts had called them and said they had found a little girl dead up here. The first thing that I thought was this child must have become frightened in the night and ran into a tree and died. I mean, crazy thinking, but I'm trying to make sense of what I was seeing. I drove my patrol car down there to see what was going on. I get out of my patrol car and when I see the one little girl exposed. I checked the two sleeping bags where the little girl was laying on one of them, and uh, there were bodies in both of them. This had been something done intentionally. From that moment on, it really felt very surreal because this was not something that happened at Girl Scout camp. In my mind, I can't visualize someone being that sick that would take the life of them little girls in that way. I called the Sheriff's Department over prior and told them that I had a triple homicide and I needed the Sheriff in County Corner. I worked for a weekly newspaper, the Prior Jeffersonian, who had a circulation of about 5,000. I was at home in bed with my wife about probably 7 o'clock in the morning, and the phone rang. It was the Prior Police Department dispatcher who said, Mike, Get your camera and all the fuel you have and go to Camp Scott. My job was to secure that scene. And then it dawned on me, I've got two different crime scenes. I've got girls here, but apparently these girls was taken from a tent. The sheriff asked me to go in the tent to take pictures inside. And I would do the crime scene photos working as a, not a journalist or a reporter, but as a, a crime scene photographer. I knew it was a scene of great trauma because there was so much blood on the floor of the tent. You try to capture the reality. I mean, you don't think about it at the time. It's composition, focus, exposure, click. All of my pictures are in black and white. My memories are in technicolor. When you see things like that, you're almost in shock that somebody could do those kind of things to another human being, a child, an innocent little child. My God, what happened inside of that tent? The area was so green, so peaceful, birds. And the sheriff was there, Pete Weaver. And they were standing around this cluster of sleeping bags. You try to isolate from the trauma. It's been 45 years since this happened. And it still comes back to me. Bays County Sheriff Pete Weaver says there are no suspects in the case. Questioned by newsmen who were kept away from the campsite, he said the girls' bodies were found about 150 feet from the tent. There was no indication they were dragged, if uh, apparently they were carried. Was there any evidence that they had been uh, sexually assaulted? There was evidence to that effect, yes. I can remember squad cars, highway patrol cars, detective cars, sheriffs. And the only thing you really knew was, was that three... Girl Scouts were dead. Death don't have no mercy in this land. Locust Grove. People say they're scared. Death don't have no mercy in this land. I locked my door night before last. First time I ever locked it. It was easily the biggest story I ever covered yeah. in my life. By 1977, I was a really young reporter. I was back at the station reading the newscast. In the news this morning, the Girl Scout murders at Locust Grove. This story just demanded almost constant attention. The brutality, the senselessness. Come to your house in the morning, it won't take long. Look in the bed and find your children gone. They brought in troopers, OSBI agents, Tulsa PD, reservists. They asked for volunteers. I had hundreds of people there. All these people came in, and then they just they sent them out. And some strange things started happening. In Tulsa, the news is already breaking. As you might expect, parents are freaking out. The girls haven't been publicly identified yet. We needed to get our kids out. The executive director at the Girl Scout Council arranged for buses to take them back to Tulsa. I'm sure for a lot of parents, they're, they're still wondering, is it possible that, you know, my child was 
You know, one of those killed. When the bus finally arrived, the parents' relief was obvious. It's a pretty emotional scene as the campers step off the bus and into the arms of their parents. But sadly, not every mom and dad will be able to hug their daughter. Arriving at camp was kind of an experience in itself. You leave the highway, then you're onto what they call the cookie trail. It's like you stepped through some kind of portal. It's taking you from civilization into something almost prehistoric. The girls were scheduled to arrive coming up from Tulsa on Sunday afternoon, and they did, hundreds of them. We met the kids at the bus. Carla and I were in the Kiowa unit. We took the girls to the camp and let them pick their tents and just help them get settled in until it was time for dinner. There were three. Counselors slept in their own tent. Campers slept with their friends or new found friends in each of the seven tents. There were four girls per tent except for the last tent and they were arranged around the main campfire and the counselor's tent. During dinner just this incredible storm rolled in and it rained hard. Finally the rain relented enough that we were able to start hiking back down to their units. It's in that last tent, tent number seven, where three little girls, ages eight, nine, and 10, are bunking together. It was about seven, eight o'clock by then, and it was dark, and it was time to settle in. We dried off as best we could. The girls were still active, giggling, shining their flashlights all over. It's very exciting the very first night. Some girls are just so giddy and excited and hyper, and others, are a little afraid because it gets very dark up in the woods. There's just blackness. Eventually things get quiet and everybody goes to bed. Later that night, I heard a noise and it wasn't like anything I had ever heard before. The noise was coming from an area near our unit. I started to go over and investigate and just see if I could shine my flashlight and see what it was. Couldn't see anything, but the noise would stop as I got closer. I didn't want anything to pounce out of the woods at me, whether it was an animal or whatever it was, I didn't want to tangle with it. And I backed away. I tried to rouse the other counselors and say, you hear that noise? You know, what do you think it is? And they were kind of like, eh, I don't know. It's probably just a critter, an animal, whatever. I awoke when my alarm went off. As I was walking out of the unit, I kind of looked to my right because I saw something in the road. I saw a couple of sleeping bags. And as I walked closer, I could actually see the figure of a, a young girl lying partially on the road and, and maybe partially off of the road. And the closer I got, I could just see that this, this young girl was, was dead. I went back and I said, you know, there's a dead kid in the road. We need to count our kids. Carla went one direction. I went to the last tent. There was blood on the floor and on the mattresses and no sleeping bags. Susan said, there's nobody in tent seven. We were short three children. There was a young girl laying out with a bag half covering her. And I started to scream. I started running, I was just running like hell, 
I woke up the camp director, Barbara Day, her husband Richard was there and he was an emergency room nurse. My husband Richard and I were trying to understand what she was saying. She was describing a girl, a camper, laying on the road. The victims who had arrived at Camp Scott only last night were identified as nine-year-old Michelle Goose of Broken Arrow, eight-year-old Lori Lee Farmer of Tulsa, and 10-year-old Denise Milner, also of Tulsa. I'm Betty Milner, mother of Denise Milner. They didn't know how to find me, and someone uh, took them to the school where I work. I was finishing up a night shift in the emergency department and got a call to the nurse's station for a phone call. They took me to the office and they told me that they had found three girls beat to death and my daughter was one of them. The executive director of the Girl Scouts was on the other end and just said, I hate to tell you this, sir. Your daughter was found out behind her tent, dead this morning. That's all I was told. So when I went home to tell Sherry, that's the only thing I knew, was that Lori was dead. I looked up, and Mo was coming to the back door. I knew something was wrong. And you said, sit down. We need to talk. Do you remember what I said? <laughs> you didn't want to sit down. I said, no, I'm not going to sit down. And you just know whatever it is is going to change everything. And he said, Lori died in the night. goes on for the murder of three little girls in a Girl Scout camp near Tulsa. As investigators hunt for evidence, hope for clues, stolen glasses, a note. Whoever wrote the note said, I'm going to kill three Girl Scouts. The counselors thought it was just a prank. Denise, to me, was exceptional. She was very eager to learn. She loved people. She had taught herself to read and write and do math when she was four years old. Denise Milner, she was just one of those quiet girls, but she also looked like a person that was just an old soul. In that way, she was just a very striking girl. Denise, she loved people. Everywhere we went, she always met somebody that she wanted to talk to. <laughs> It was to have been a big week for Laurie Lee, who had been anticipating her ninth birthday party this Saturday after a week at her first camp. The Laurie that I remember is just the happy big sister. When I close my eyes and just picture her and our family, it is of the laughter and sweetness. Laurie actually lived on the street behind my house. We rode the same bus together to school Lori, she just had this kind of like a little mother instinct about her, not just with her own siblings, but with everybody around her. Sunday morning, we finished packing up, and I believe we went over to the Girl Scout headquarters about noon. Up until the day to go to camp, Denise was excited about it, but then she decided she didn't want to go. I told her if she would just go and see what it's like. If she didn't like it, then we would come and get her. We watched Lori get on, and I saw her in the window. We waved, and we said, I love you. All the campers were writing letters home to their parents that night. Yeah. Well, this is her letter. Dear Mommy, Daddy, we're getting ready to go to bed at 745. I've met two new friends, Michelle Gousset and Denise Milner. I'm sharing a tent with them. We're all writing letters now because there's hardly anything else to do with love, Lori. Denise said, Dear Mom, I don't like camp. It's awful. Mom, I don't want to stay in camp for two weeks. I want to come home. It never, never occurred to me that after you got there, you might die. Uh, 
Sheriff's deputies are allowing no one inside the camp and are saying very little about the investigation. We knew that this was going to be a major national story. The investigators were really focused on gathering any kind of physical evidence they could because they knew the pressure was going to build. They found the girls in each one of these sleeping bags and, and there was evidence that they'd been molested. It was bloody with indication of blunt force trauma. We took pictures of uh, stuff that we found in the area. Glasses, hairbrushes, and things that were just scattered. One of the things that they found was a, uh, a flashlight the attacker had left behind. There was a 9-volt lantern laying next to the Milner girl. It had a black trash bag wrapped around the front of the lens with a hole in it. And it, the light just comes out very small. Just enough where you can kind of, you know, you can direct it. There are a few clues. A red flashlight was found near the bodies, and it has yielded one good fingerprint. They recovered hair, and ultimately they would recover what they believe was semen. In 1977, of course, scientists knew about DNA, but how it would be used in law enforcement was still very much in its infancy. Police were focused on incidents that were reported in the camp, and there was a note left that really caught the attention of investigators. We had pre-camp, which is a week of just putting the staff together, uh, just making preparations for the girls to be there. At that time, I found out that my purse was missing. Whoever stole my purse had reached under my bed from the outside. Earlier in the week, one of the tents had a big, large rip in the front flap of the fabric. We also found we were missing a lantern and a small hand axe. I was also missing some items that were actually found with the bodies. Counselors also remember a note found in an empty donut box in the months before the campers arrived. Whoever wrote the note said that I'm gonna kill three Girl Scouts and the counselors thought it was just a prank. Innocent mischief or some kind of a warning, it only adds to the mystery for police who are desperate to identify the killer. The first person I remember talking to was Pete Weaver, the sheriff, and interviewing him. If I remember correctly, in those first interviews, there wasn't any suspect. What is clear is that Michelle and, and Lori were murdered first and that Denise was led away from the tent or carried from there and then uh, raped and murdered at the site where ultimately all the bodies were found. In third grade, I moved to Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. I had gotten sick, and I remember being devastated that I could not attend Girl Scout camp. When news broke of this tragedy, I remember specifically being in our living room. Residents around Locust Grove believe it was an outsider and that worries them. It also scares them the police aren't talking about a motive or a suspect. It was in this moment when my mother was telling me what happened to Denise, Michelle, and Lori that I came to learn what murder was. Once they identified the crime scene areas and roped off those areas, then all these people came in and then they just they sent them out. That's what commences the largest manhunt in Oklahoma state history. Helicopters in the air, dogs on the ground, just a, a massive effort. Next to the camp in the little town of Locust Grove, people say they're scared. For them, the authorities can't move fast enough to catch the killer. Well, I'm horrified, Nancy, but I like everyone else. From almost the get-go, one name was on their radar. Oklahoma authorities believe they know who killed three young Girl Scouts during a camp out near Locust Grove earlier this month. The only thing you really knew was, was that three Girl Scouts were dead. 
but we didn't know exactly how they died. We didn't know the circumstances. We didn't really we didn't have know there was a suspect. Yeah. And apparently there was from the very beginning. Oklahoma authorities believe they know who killed three young girl scouts during a camp out near Locust Grove earlier this month. Talking to various investigators, it seemed pretty clear to me back then that almost immediately they suspected Jean Leroy Hart. I think that Jean Leroy Hart name came up pretty early because his family just lived within a half a mile of the grounds. Of course, it's not just Hart's access to Camp Scott that raises suspicion. It turns out Jean Hart also has a history of violence against women. He was accused and subsequently uh, charged and convicted of uh, picking up two women from a bar and then uh, taking them and raping them. At the time the little girls were killed, Jean Lee Roy Hart had been uh, an escapee for almost four years. It's speculated that Pete Weaver, the sheriff, had a personal vendetta against Hart because Hart had made him look foolish by escaping twice from his jail. And that's really what was motivating this. I think the investigators would say at the time they only started suspecting him when they found the cave. This Locust Grove area is a hilly area. It's, it's got a lot of cliffs in it, a lot of canyons, a lot of caves. We were looking for evidence. Anything that we could find that you could tie it into somebody. There are three principal cave sites that factor into this case. All of them within you know, the vicinity of Camp Scott. In searching these sites, they would find some items they would eventually use in the case against him. They found photographs and could trace them back to Jean Lee Roy Hart. They found the plastic tape that he used to put over the lens of his flashlight. And they found the sunglasses uh, that a counselor identified as hers. With those, they would be able to put him in Camp Scott within a day of the actual murders. First degree murder warrant is out for Leroy Hart. Police zeroed in on Hart after finding torn up pieces of a wedding picture in a cave near the scene of the murder. They identified the people in it, then found that Hart once worked for the photographer while he was on a work release program before he escaped from jail. Authorities came to believe that Gene Hart had been in the vicinity of the camp in the days leading up to the crimes and that uh, these cave sites were sites that he had been using during his time as a fugitive. I found the cave, and when I got inside the cave, I got to looking around, and at the, at the opening of the cave, somebody built four little fires. And four fires is significant in the culture. So I'm sitting in there, and I'm thinking, okay, now this is uh, Indian. Agents soon discover more than one cave, along with an abandoned cellar that give them clues and something more disturbing. Within the, the first four or five days after the murders, the sheriff went to the cave and they found where somebody had painted the killer was here on the wall. There was a sense in the community that developed that he was being framed for this because he was uh, Native American or back then they would have said because he's an Indian. It really did become a racial issue because Gino Ray Hart was a Cherokee. And this happened when the American Indian movement was growing and Wounded Knee had happened and there was a big fight for Native American rights. There has been racism in my home state against Native Americans and his tribe rallied around him. Was suspected for years and years after he escaped from prison that Gene Lori Hart was in that area. Certainly he was on Pete Weaver's radar screen because Gene Lori Hart was a well-known individual in Locust Grove. He was a, a football hero. The high school football team, the Pirates, they're a big draw. Anybody who followed, you know, football in the early 1960s in Locust Grove would have known Gene Hart. Gene Lori Hart his story initially was he was the all-american boy how could he do this high school football star as he was coming out of high school he had offers to play football on scholarship but he chose to not go to college and to stay there and work and get married and raise a child it would be hard for any of us to think that he did it but things can happen 
just a good old boy from northeastern Oklahoma. He was those things, but he was also something else. Agents started tracking Jean Leroy Hart, a convicted rapist and a recent escapee from the Mays County Jail. While well, I was down here, we moved through here. I've seen reports of as high as six or seven hundred people, boots on the ground. Just a massive effort to no avail. Finding a guy like Gene Leroy Hart, who knew those woods, who knew everyone in town. I agreed with what some investigator told me at the time. If he didn't want to be found, they weren't going to find him, probably. Trail just just disappeared. I can tell you, it is another one of those things that sort of fed into this developing story of who exactly is it that we're up against here. We don't know where he is, but we need to find this man before it happens again. There are five tactical squads uh, strategically located around the area, four of those manned by Oklahoma Highway Patrol units, and one of those is an FBI tactical unit. I just know that this man is probably the most experienced woodsman that you could comprehend. As part of this massive manhunt, they brought in some dogs who apparently were very well known in the uh, canine tracking community. They brought what they called the super dogs. They came from out of state, and some strange things started happening. We're reading in the newspaper. Hard is put a curse on the dogs. I mean, those are the good lines. <clears throat> Somehow, mysteriously, two of those dogs would actually die while participating in this. Before you know it, they were blaming Gene Leroy Hart for the death of these dogs. There was talk among the search that Gene Hart was a shapeshifter, that he could turn himself into a bird or an animal that he could leap from tree to tree. They have stories of people that change. A man that changes from a man to a wolf. And he runs off. Everybody was just making all these little stories up and fantasies were just, you know, just going crazy. A lot of this, you know, are part of the legends and myths of, of native culture in Oklahoma. But that was out there, that idea that there was something special about him, that he wasn't just another fugitive. I simply took it as a way of trying to explain away the fact that they had had a miserable experience of trying to find one guy in eastern Oklahoma with millions of dollars worth of man hours and time. Hart proves to be so good at hiding from authorities that they eventually call off the manhunt months go by and while there are numerous sightings nobody seems to be able to put their hands on Jean Leroy Hart he became almost this mythical figure this anti-hero type they were never going to catch him sometimes I would watch the news and somebody would say they couldn't find who did it and they were all chasing him and and it was just like I, I can't I can't even it's too much I couldn't deal with it in the early stages of the investigation, answers for the families were just as elusive as finding who the actual suspect was. And there was a level of frustration in Oklahoma that was setting in. Who would do this? We were all just struggling with the same thing in our own way and just trying to get through the weeks and the months. Every day was a struggle. And the first thing I'd open my eyes in the morning, it was just another day she wasn't there. I picked the camp, the week, and I can't make that guilt go away. Everybody was really scared. I remember lots of stories where people just stopped letting their kids go outside. I didn't want to go near the windows. I didn't want to sleep in the bed. I was terrified that this person was going to come back and get us. 
right after it happened, I remember life changed a little bit. All of a sudden, doors were locked. It made me think twice before doing anything after that. It changed the way people live. Not many stories change the way people live, but this one did. It changed how you watched your kids, what you let them do, where they would go. Authorities are now beyond frustrated. And as the hunt drags on, it becomes pretty clear that conventional police methods aren't gonna find heart. That's when Harvey Pratt and his brother, both law enforcement and both Native American, go undercover. We just kind of hung around different places and went to different uh, little stores. We looked like everybody else. We didn't look like investigators. What Harvey Pratt eventually found out was that Gene Leroy Hart was likely hiding at the home of a native medicine man named Sam Pigeon. They were tipped off that Hart may be holed up in a cabin in a remote part of uh, an area called the Cooks and Hills. The Cooks and Hills was a place known for the outlaws that would find refuge there. It was one of the toughest, most isolated places in North America. That was the old stomping grounds of guys like Pretty Boy Floyd, Bonnie and Clyde, and various others because I think it was easy to hide. A lot of criminals in that whole area back in the 1870s, 1880s, there are probably more gunfights in Western history in that area than anywhere else in the country. It was just a haven for outlaws. 10 months after the girls were brutally murdered, 10 months of literally beating the bushes to find this suspect, authorities finally have Gene Leroy Hart in their sights. But is he the killer? 45 years later, a cold case and a new sheriff. There are people who have suggested that some of this evidence could have been planted. 45 years later, how can you be certain? Is a man on trial for a crime he didn't commit? It had been such a high-profile case at the time that I just assumed everything that could be done had been done on it. When I saw that only one item had been submitted for DNA evidence, I was a little shocked. It's the need to know everything and i don't think we know everything it's that hill right there that's the girl scout camp it's been 45 years since this happened and it still comes back to me lots of questions about who committed this crime but if the question were put to you killed these girls got uh, suspect number one in the state's most infamous uh, murder case now in custody they believe Gina Roy Hart was being framed there is another person that uh, may be a better suspect for this crime you know, three little girls lost their lives and we've done DNA evidence on one item and I knew there were hundreds of other items available you have 40 years of a lot of conspiracy theory hogwash and it's time for some of the bed. let's tell the whole truth so you could close this case right now camping near Locust Grove, Oklahoma, were murdered. Today, authorities say they are looking for a 33-year-old escaped convict named Gene Leroy Hart, whom they expect to charge with the crime. We didn't know much except that three Girl Scouts were likely murdered. Local county and state police searched another area not far away today. Their search was unsuccessful, too. Hart's a local guy, a Native American, 
And he's also an escaped convict with a long rap sheet, a rapist and a kidnapper. This went way beyond any crime anyone had ever heard about in that area or in the United States in general. And people were afraid. Police expected it would be difficult to find the suspect here in these hills because he is a native here and has successfully evaded the police for more than four years since he escaped from the county jail in 1973. You asked for an opinion. My opinion is he's somewhere still in the area. Imagine being a Girl Scout then. They're in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Coulda, woulda, shoulda been on that trip. It has stuck with me my whole life. Did I get scared? A little bit. There was fear of, I hate to use the expression, but the boogeyman could be real. Weeks soon turn into months, and the families of these murdered little girls are desperate for some kind of progress. They're in a kind of limbo. I feel like our life was work, children, what happened to Lori? The hardest thing was that my family and friends couldn't talk about it because nobody wanted me to talk about it. You know, it's like, it, don't they know that if you don't talk about it, you still think about it? An undercover agent, a native himself, was the key. Once they started zeroing in on a Native American and they started getting some informants that were saying some things about him, and, and that's when I think then they asked me if I would go up there and do some undercover work and see if you can't locate and talk to somebody, that'll give him up. And the OSBI agents get a tip. Hart may or may not be in a, a cabin in a remote area called the Cookson Hills. It's a very wild and mountainous area. What you will see in news reports described as a small tar paper shack. The rumors are that he's using Native American magic or medicine. I said, and if I'm doing that, I said, I need, I need to have some protection. And so that's why I did the same thing. You know, I did, I used the same things. I had to bless my bullets. You know, that means that if I have to use a weapon, they'll, I'll be accurate, I'll be safe. The plan was to circle a house so he couldn't get out. They don't know if he's alone. They don't know if he's armed. They just start running in. An agent gun drawn, gets inside. Gene Hart came running at him and he said, you don't want to die today. And, and he stopped. He said, you don't want to die today. Eight state agents arrested Hart, handcuffing him, they said, as he tried to run away. A nurseryman who shared the cabin said Hart had discussed the murders but denied committing them. He said he didn't do it. Watch the truck. Lights. Jerry Light. Today, Hart was taken to a courthouse in Pryor, Oklahoma, near the campground, to be arraigned on three counts of first-degree murder. My van was uh, covered in dust, and I took my hand, and I wrote, We got Hart, H-A-R-T, real big, you know, we got Hart. So the news cycle kicked off again. I mean, here we are 10 months in, and now a lot more copyright because we've got uh, suspect number one in the state's most infamous uh, murder case now in custody. I think some of the press called, and I said, all we're interested in is justice. And it seemed like now we're moving toward that. That uh, was probably very naive on our part. You would think that people in that area would rally around law enforcement because these were three Girl Scouts. This is Locust Grove, where the killings took place last year and where Gene Leroy Hart grew up. Usually in such cases, there are a lot of hard feelings, but many people here don't believe Hart did it. No way, shape, form, or fashion. 
No, wait. Why? Huh? Why? Because I know Gene like I know me, and I'm not capable of that kind of crime, and Gene's not it. They believe Gene Leroy Hart was being framed. The mother of one of the dead girls says the sympathy makes a fair trial difficult. We don't know if he's guilty or if he's not guilty. And I don't think that people who don't know any more about it than we do should say, oh, I feel like he didn't do it. I knew him three or four years ago. The case became controversial with many of Hart's former neighbors questioning whether he would even receive a fair trial. He will never get the justice. What you there, there is no justice in the white man's law. The accused was Native American, and the population was large percentage Native American. We were seen as outsiders. We were the parents of the kids from Tulsa, big town. In Oklahoma, this still goes down as the most serious crime ever committed in this state. And everyone in the country was going to be following this. State prosecutors are now lining up their evidence, and they're feeling pretty confident. No one knew it at the time, but, you know, really this roller coaster that the state was on at that point was really just uh, beginning. A lot of the drama is yet to come. And the overwhelming question is now, is the wrong man on trial? All trials are different. This one I wouldn't say was a circus, perhaps a carnival, because Corbin Isaacs was theatrical. Lots of grand gestures and arm waving and smiles to the jury. His defense attorneys tried to show Hart was framed. The defense strategy is pretty simple. So reasonable doubt. Hart's attorney hinted the police may have planted evidence on Hart when he was arrested. Those sunglasses. The defense asks if the counselor's glasses were really in the cellar or if they were planted there. In talking to an officer from the Locust Grove Police Department, those glasses had been in the property room after the initial search of the campgrounds. So how they got from there to the cave, if they were even in the cave, was one of those early questions that came up. I don't know why he would have misinformed us or, or lied. There was not, all things considered, a lot of obvious evidence to be found, which has been another maddening thing in this case. That flashlight was found at the murder scene and it tied Gene Leroy Hart to where he had been hiding now. There was believed to be a fingerprint on the flashlight. And that, to investigators, they thought that was going to be a slam dunk. Defense lawyers say the fingerprint is so smudged, it can't be reliably matched to Hart. They had the sperm. They say connected, you know, Hart to the crimes. When this crime was committed in 1977, there was no thought of DNA. You know, at this time, all they could do is they could take these sperm cells and look at them under a microscope. I mean, you're pretty much confined to what a microscope can tell you. You know, all they could say was, I think, a high likelihood that they're from the same person. But, uh, but that's about it. Not good enough, says the defense. Still, prosecutors have one piece of evidence they are confident directly ties Hart to the murders. Those wedding pictures. After a week of scouring the Locust Grove area, officials found their first solid lead near the camp. Two photographs of three women. Police connected the pictures with convicted rapist Jean Leroy Hart, who had served time here at the Granite State Reformatory and assisted the prison photographer who had taken the pictures. Still, a new witness is casting a bit of a shadow over Granite State's warden, Pete Weaver. At the trial, we had a jailer named Alan Little to come in and testify that those pictures were in Pete Weaver's desk when Hart broke out of jail. He said Pete Weaver hated Gene Leroy Hart. He would pull the pictures out of the desk and throw them down on the desk and say, I'll get that son of a bitch if it's the last thing I do. There is a sense in which, you know, a trial is a storytelling competition and the side which is able to tell the better story, the one that makes sense to the jury, that resonates with them, is probably going to be successful. And what better story to offer? Maybe it was someone else. Garvin Isaacs reminded jurors witnesses had told of seeing this man, William Stevens, near the Girl Scout camp the day of the killings. They said he'd had scratches on his arm and red stains on his boots. 
It was it Bill Stevens? That was the guy, I believe, that was in the Lexington State Prison. Bill Stevens was one of the suspects. Um, the way this come to light was through a lady named Joyce Payne. Joyce Payne insists she gave Stevens a flashlight exactly like the one discovered at the crime scene. When you connect a flashlight with a guy that's a rapist in prison and at the trial, Joyce Payne testified to that. Garvin Isaacs gave alternative theories that evidence had been planted or that that evidence is shoddy. They were succeeding uh, in, in poking holes. And after 12 days in court, both sides finally rest their case. I was assuming deliberating might take a while, but early morning, we got a call that they had reached a verdict. And um, they tried all three cases together, so it all happened really quickly. The Gousses weren't even in the courtroom. It took jurors five hours to make up their minds. Not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. When the verdict of not guilty was announced, Gene Leroy Hart, a Cherokee Indian, buried his face in his hands and cried. Was the jury right? Which means the real killer is still out there? You have 40 years of a lot of conspiracy theory hogwash. And it's time to put some of it to bed. Let's tell the whole truth. There were tears as the trial of the Mays County Courthouse in Pryor came to its stunning conclusion. Gene Leroy Hart was judged not guilty. I was just blown away. I said, oh, I cannot believe that, that uh, he was found not guilty. People of Mays County had to see it for themselves, had to hear the verdict ring through the courthouse and rip through the hearts of the girls' families. When it was all over, we felt like we had really been victimized twice. First, by the person who committed the crime, and second, by the justice system. When he was found not guilty, and we stopped by the cemetery, I just said we failed. We failed. The outcome of this trial didn't affect the fact that he still owed the state somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 years. So Gene Hart went back to the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister to serve out the rest of his sentence. And then another twist. After Hart is back in maximum security at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary as inmate number 79547. He is doing some exercise in the prison yard. And uh, as soon as he finishes, he starts to walk off the prison grounds and he collapses. So Gene Hart, after all of this, suffers a heart attack. He dies right there in the prison yard. They did an autopsy and they did find that he had severe heart disease. It was this heart attack that killed him. And many now wonder, did the truth die with him? Girl Scouts close Camp Scott. The years come and go, and it sits empty and fades away. Those three little girls never grow older, but their families do. Decades later, Mays County has a new sheriff, Mike Reed, and he's confronted with the biggest unsolved case in Oklahoma history. Starting out as a young sheriff, the last thing I wanted to do was weighed off into something that was 40 years old. Almost every day, uh, I take my children to school and pick them up. I live just right close to the Girl Scouts. The quickest way to town from my house is to drive right by there. So every time I drive by there, my mind for just a split second goes all the way down that telephone pole and looks down there at that tree. And there's just no way of driving by there without it hitting you in the arm, going, remember? 
Have you had long stretches of time where you haven't thought about this case, or has it consumed you? Oh, no, it's a very consuming case. I, I have most definitely had to step away from the case. You'll work on the case for a while, and it, it consumes you so bad that it starts to affect you emotionally. Reed begins sorting through boxes and boxes of that old evidence, including those clues from the cave and in and around the campground. So what exactly links Hart to the crimes? There is stuff throughout the camp that is reported the next day that is missing, stolen. Some of the stuff was found 10 months later, not at the camp, but in the very house where Gene Hart had been hiding. Okay, so there was a blue mirror and a corncob pipe that had been in the footlocker of one of the counselors. It had been taken out of her footlocker the night of the homicides. Um, those two items were actually found in Sam Pitchin's cabin where Jean Leroy Hart was actually arrested in 78. At the scene, you have a flashlight that has masking tape on it. Inside the flashlight, there was also part of a newspaper that was pushed up to hold the battery in place. Now, having said all that, hold that right there, because that's going to be a big part of the puzzle that's coming. First off, Reed says there's no doubt about the seller's connection to Hart. It's right there at his childhood home. See this old shack and cellar and stuff right out there? That was where Hart's mom lived. And Hart lived there. Of course, that hill right there, that's the Girl Scout camp. So that tells you what the proximity is. That cellar is where they found those wedding pictures, some sunglasses stolen from the camp, masking tape, and a copy of a newspaper. Half of the newspaper that is found at the, the cellar is in the flashlight. It matches the exact, newspaper found in the exact flashlight. Exact tear, everything. Well, if Hart's in the cellar with one part of the paper and the other part is in the flashlight at the camp, then Hart was at the camp. So I actually started reenacting evidence of the crime that I had. When you were entering the tent, this would be where the steps are. Here is the first cot. You take a couple steps back. Here is the second cot. The guy had brought my equipment with him. A red flashlight, a roll of duct tape, black with a close resemblance to this. The suspect has a rope that is a little thinner than this. Immediately as you're stepping in, you strike the first child in the head. She had one blow, that was a death blow. It's here, it shows where the blood splatters was. And he considers a disturbing possibility that Hart was targeting 10-year-old Denise Milner. You can walk up to a tent. You can step in, you can go wham. You can take about three steps. Kawam, kawam, and now I have one child to deal with, which is the child that I believe I want. And I was just wanting to hurt people. Why didn't I just beat her down like I hit the other ones? She don't have those blows. There's hardly even a speck of blood over here. And you have a whole other aspect that comes with this, is her clothes, her undergarments, her pajamas, all of them was removed off of her inside this tent. The suspect has a rope, you know, there's some, some sort of a loop ligature around the neck, but it's just twisted and twisted and walked this child out. This child was duct taped to this tree. She has a gag, it, it, it's, it's bad. And it's also familiar because Gene Hart had done that before. The same type of taping and controlling method of the victims was used in the 1966 kidnapping and rape. Same thing, ligatures, they was taped, they was bound, they was taped trees while there was same exact MO. The deeper he looks, the more questions he's got. Until he finds something they missed, could 21st century tech solve a case that was decades old? We knew everything about her life. I gave birth to her. I 
washed her hair. I knew what she wore. It seems impossible to not know everything we can know about how she died. Gene Hart may have been found not guilty, but there's still plenty of disagreement on whether he killed Michelle, Lori, and Denise. I can't tell you with any other certainty other than my own personal judgment that Gene Hart did not commit the crimes. I can't prove he didn't, just like they couldn't prove he did. This is a story that sort of lends itself to conspiracy theorists, and there are a lot of them out there. There was a lot of different opinions that was out there when you started looking into the case. It was like, my gosh, this, this, is, this is overwhelming almost. Over the years, there have been all kinds of theories. There were theories about others who could have committed this crime. Bill Stevens, a violent criminal, a convicted rapist. Was there enough to, con to connect him? Absolutely not. Number one, we have his DNA. His DNA did not match. Number two, there were polygraph tests taken in the past. As for the woman who testified that she gave Stevens the flashlight, after the trial, she admits she lied and is charged with perjury. In reality, that flashlight leads straight back to Hart. And the tape right here matched up almost exactly. Part of it found near the victims and then part of it found elsewhere. Yeah, there's considered a fracture match. And it is exact. One side of it was the edge of the home flashlight. The other side of it was the roll of masking tape that was at the cellar. That's where all the other stuff is at that's recovered that links him back to this scene. What about the rest of the evidence found in that cellar, like those wedding pictures that pointed to Hart? There have been suggestions that maybe some of this evidence could have been planted by investigators. If I want to plant these pictures to put Gene Hart there, because I know they're his, why in the world wouldn't I just walk out here anywhere at the camp, at the scene, and just drop them and just walk off? Because there's 50 or 75 officers there. Somebody's going to walk up there and go, hey, look at there. It makes no sense whatsoever when you bring it all to the light. I thought of all possibilities of Hart being not the one who did it, it being someone else. I've thought that many, many times. But no one has ever been able to come up with another credible person. But all of this evidence is purely circumstantial. What Reed wants is physical proof that ties Hart to the murders. And that's where one of Lori's old schoolmates comes in. After Lori's death, I just felt like people forgot. Other crimes happened, life happens. What about Lori? Is anybody working on it? I didn't know. That was hard. I got a call from Cheryl Stokes. She told me she was now with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and she had lived with the hope that someday she could help in some way our family. In 2013, we started a forensic case review. It seems like all the leads have been combed over and gone through and still no answers, but there are new technologies every day. There's always something that can be done that hasn't been done. Our job is to make sure that that law enforcement agency and those families have the resources that we have available in order to bring that case to a successful conclusion. When the Girl Scout murders happened, it had been such a high profile case at the time that I just assumed everything that could be done had been done on it. So when I pulled it out and started looking and saw that only one item had been submitted for DNA evidence, I was a little shocked. I knew there were hundreds of other items available for DNA testing. So we started working on it. In the late 80s, that one item that was sent to the FBI for DNA analysis was a semen stain from Michelle Gousset's sleeping bag. From biological evidence from the sperm, they were able to come up with a partial profile. It was officially inconclusive. In the beginning, DNA could only do so much. 
Back in the 80s, I had to have a pool of blood to get a DNA sample from. Today, you can put thousands of cells on a pinhead, and that's all they need. We went back and looked at what was available, the evidence that we actually had in our possession. I believe originally there were around 400 pieces of evidence that were collected. We started with, of course, the items that were around the bodies, the sleeping bags that the girls were in, blood stains, semen stains, hairs. We even went to the point of cutting into one of the sleeping bags, pulling it apart, and getting some of the stuffing out of the inside of it. Technology is continuing to change and get more precise. That one little thing that can solve the case might be part of DNA testing. This evidence is decades old, untested. Will it be able to tell us anything new about this case? Do I think we will get answers that could satisfy curiosity? Yes. Does that give closure to the families? I don't, I don't know, but the answer is there. All the DNA testing that's been done on this case, it excludes every suspect that I've ever heard or know of has been brought up in this case, except for one person. The truth will finally be out there, and people won't be able to run from it. You know, I've learned going back into this case that time does not heal all wounds. Because of some of the conspiracy theories in this case, I think that even with a full DNA match at some point, you would still have a significant number of people who would say, nah, you know, it's fixed. They're able to get DNA samples that they can match that they weren't able to get before, and they keep getting better and better at it. One of the items contained hairs that have been collected from the floor of the tent. And so they go through and look at every one of the hairs, see which one has the best potential for giving us a DNA profile. They analyzed several from the floor of the tent. One of them did give us a partial profile. All the DNA testing that's been done in this case, it excludes every suspect that I've ever heard or know of has been brought up in this case, except for one person. And that person would be Gene Leroy Hart. What about the review from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, that panel of forensic and behavioral experts examining the case from every angle? Over that course of the three days, we listened to all of the facts, all of the lab analyses, uh, everything about that case, and we came to a consensus of opinion. Gene Hart was, in fact, the right person. You've got a suspect who's dead. You've got a jury that acquitted him. Even if you close this case now, is that gonna bring any kind of closure or finality to this community? The only reason I even am doing this is to try to at least give a little bit of peace, one way, shape, or form to the family. Because I know what it's like to stand over and look at my little baby girls sleeping and they can't. I don't think that there'll ever be closure. And, and I can tell you from working with families who someone says that word closure is to them, closing is like closing a door and you're done with it. For me, I guess as much closure as I'm going to get, I already have it. Solving the case will not give me closure. There were some things that I felt compelled to do in Lori's memory and honor and that was to help other families we want to see this through for lori we want to see it through for our family but we also want to see it through for denise and michelle the former family could have dropped from public view but they didn't they went to extraordinary lengths they changed their lives to be advocates for victims we had some who came feeling the anguish that you've heard Bo and I describe, and then I've seen them reach out and help the next family after them. Please welcome to the stage Lori Farmer's incredible parents, Sherry and Bo Farmer. 
This is really for Lori and Denise and Michelle. We continue daily to realize how many people they have touched. Even when I think that I'm beyond it, life has this surprising way of reminding you. I can't replace the lives that the children would have lived. I want to think that they would have had beautiful, magnificent lives. And I wish that more than anything that that was the end of the story. And still no end to their heartbreak and sorrow. For now, the Farmer family is reluctant to concede that Hart was the murderer or that he 